America, America, God mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. O oh, beautiful for patriot dream that sees beyond the years, thine alabaster cities gleam undimmed by human tears. The second United Nations offensive was on the North African front. British General Alexander had taken over the supreme command in this theater. General Montgomery led the British Eighth Army. At El Alamein on the night of October 23, 1942, the Allies started their drive against the German Africa Corps. After a heavy artillery barrage, General Montgomery surprised the Germans by reversing blitzkrieg tactics and sending his infantry in first. A week later, British tanks were pouring through a gap in the enemy's lines. This sledgehammer blow smashed German resistance. It rolled the Africa Corps back in a retreat which was not to stop until they reached Tripoli, four months later and 1,200 miles away. While the fighting was continuing in North Africa, President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Churchill met at Casablanca to determine further strategical moves. The main objectives for 1943 were outlined. Invade Sicily and Italy at the first opportunity intensify counterattacks against Hitler's submarines and launch a combined bomber offensive on Germany. Begin preparing for a major offensive in the Pacific. Accept nothing short of unconditional surrender as a basis for ending the war. This was the kind of positive, top-level determination the free world had long awaited. There was swift response on all fighting fronts. Tripoli fell to the British Eighth Army. Bitter fighting, Nazi tanks hurled back Allied forces to the Algerian border. But then, combined American, British, and French units stopped the German Italian drive at Kasserine and overran Tunisia. On the Tunisian front, British engineers render harmless landmines left to cover the German retreat. From the south, the British drive is on in force as Americans push through the central sector. The wreckage of a shattered army lies strewn across the desert. In Africa, the Nazis' days are numbered. United States bombers take off from bases in the Arctic to blast the remaining Japanese on Kiska Island in the Aleutians. Over the enemy base, tons of huge projectiles drift lazily to Earth, guided to their mark by the famous American bomb site. When the big eggs land, they explode like clouds, and one more Jap base is wiped out. Somewhere in China, another American Air Force under General Cheneau maps a raid on Japanese-held Hong Kong.
fighter planes escort the bombers as the squadron flies high over Asia. Hong Kong, and thereafter the Kowloon Naval Base. The Chinese cameraman who made these pictures knows it well. Hong Kong is his native city. Now he returns to help rid it of the Japs. base in China, safe and sound. American pilots get a warm welcome. They've blasted the Japs from Hong Kong to Kiska. In the Pacific, on bloody Guadalcanal, fighting an entirely different kind of warfare, United States troops overcame the last fanatical Japanese resistance and won complete control of the island and its airfields. A flying fortress arrives in New Guinea, bringing General Douglas MacArthur. The United Nations leader in the South Pacific is welcomed by the commanding officer of an American air base. Riding over roads that were literally hacked from the jungle, General MacArthur drives to the front. Inland, he sees friendly native carriers, protected by Australian troops, keeping open supply lines bringing food, oil, and ammunition for Allied fighters driving against Japanese positions on New Guinea. At an advanced air base, the general meets some of the flyers who are constantly harassing enemy shipping. Even now, a giant B-24 is taking aboard a load of bombs as word reaches the base that a Japanese cargo ship is steaming off the coast. The crew is anxious to be off. Target sighted. Machine gunners ready. The big bomber roars down and rakes the ship from stem to stern. The second time over, bombs are on their mark, and the freighter is crippled by the explosion. crew flashes the message, mission accomplished. In the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, Allied bombers sank eight transports and four destroyers of a Japanese convoy of 16 ships. One days after the Allied landings in North Africa, Tunis and Bizerte fell before the drive of American, British, and French forces. drive reached its full fury with lightning speed, in the air and on the ground. The enemy was hit, harder and harder, crushed in a vice from which there was no escape. Thank you. 
in five days, all German resistance in Tunisia collapsed. The Axis forces surrendered. The myth of Hitler's super race was beginning to crack. defense of Stalingrad, the Soviet army turning the Nazi six-month assault into the most ghastly military disaster in German history. beaten Nazis pour from house after house in abject surrender. Hitler's generals give up too, 24, including a field marshal. Here is Lieutenant General von Daniel, commander of the veteran 376th Division. Biggest catch of all, Field Marshal Frederick von Paulus, Commander-in-Chief of all Axis armies at Stalingrad. Taken to headquarters of General Shumilov for questioning, von Paulus has much to answer for. He is the man who ordered the extermination of every civilian in Stalingrad. Calmly, quietly, General Shumilov reviews von Paulus' record. This is the von Paulus who, two months before, threatened the families of his own soldiers with death if one man should surrender. Berlin claimed he was captured only because he was gravely wounded. Actually, a young Red Army lieutenant found him hiding in the basement of a department store and brought him in without a struggle. These also gave up, cold, starved, emaciated, defeated, remnants of 22 beaten Nazi divisions. Now they plod toward a Russian prison. flag flies again over the heroic city of Stalin as endless lines of Nazi prisoners write the final chapter in the Battle of Stalingrad. Here the might of the German Sixth Army met the courage of a people fighting for life and liberty. In the faraway Aleutian Islands, American troops had landed on Attu. farther away in New Guinea, American and Australian troops drove back the stubborn and fanatical enemy in close fighting in malaria-infested jungles. Among the battle casualties we had suffered while fighting in the Buna area, 
were three of our general officers, shot in action within less than 100 yards of the Japanese line. From victories on the deserts of North Africa, the fog-bound illusions, to the tropical island of Guadalcanal and the New Guinea jungles, where our troops were driving forward against desperate Japanese resistance, we had indeed spread our forces around the world. Who was it that once said, the United States was incapable of fighting a two-front war. Within less than 16 months, the United States Navy had performed a miracle of salvage. Of all the ships sunk or damaged on December 7th, 1941 at Pearl Harbor, all but three were back in service and in fighting trim by May 1943. An achievement on a scale unequaled in naval history. the Germans had taken virtually all of Stalingrad by late 1942. Their conquest was short-lived. Early in 1943, the Russians launched a massive counter- retook Stalingrad, destroying a Nazi army of 330,000, capturing 17 of Hitler's generals. had started to turn in Russia. In June of 1943, hundreds of Royal Air Force planes engaged in a non-stop aerial offensive over occupied Europe that continued unremittingly for 10 days. was turning in the air over Hitler's fortress Europe, American Army, Navy, and Air Forces, along with those of Australia and New Zealand, launched a concerted offensive to drive the Japanese out of New Guinea and the northern Solomon Islands. on Rendova Island were wiped out. Our troops drove for the Munda airfield on New Georgia Island. With 
fall of North Africa in Allied hands, preparations for Operation Husky were begun immediately to attack the soft underbelly of Europe. The immediate target, Sicily. Little time was lost. Only 60 days after the surrender of Axis forces in North Africa, Patton's 7th Army invaded Sicily simultaneously with British and Canadian troops under Montgomery. Some 3,000 craft were employed to land an initial force of 160,000 troops. Almost 14,000 vehicles, about 600 tanks, nearly 2,000 guns. But Sicily was held by more than 200,000 Italian and German troops, strongly entrenched on rugged terrain. It was to be a tough, hard-fought campaign. of Nazi Europe through Italy by the American Fifth Army. Embarking for Salerno, just below Naples, the great amphibious force of Lieutenant General Mark Clark strikes for the north, even as Montgomery's Eighth Army rolls virtually unopposed through the south. At sunset, the huge convoy gets underway. Ships extending over a thousand square miles of the Tyrrhenian Sea. General Clark, 5th Army Commander, and Vice Admiral Henry Hewitt, commanding the fleet. Salerno, then Naples, is their objective. Already the British 8th occupies the boot of Italy. As Montgomery plunges northward to join the Americans, Clark's forces strike for Salerno. Aboard ship, Ranger battalions study relief maps of the Italian coast. Every mountain and every valley is memorized as they steam for Salerno. During the night, the 5th Army swarms ashore. In the faint light of dawn, under attack from German batteries emplaced in the hills, they dig in, establish their beachhead, and fight back. sunrise, ships and supplies are still pouring in. Here, the biggest battle of the Mediterranean campaign develops around this initial thrust into metropolitan Italy. Pushed back time and again by superior Nazi forces, the Fighting Fifth is reinforced on schedule. units are brought up and the Americans take the offensive.
General Clark directs the attack from the beach itself. Meanwhile, the Italian fleet steams for Allied ports. General Eisenhower and Admiral Cunningham see the terms of surrender carried out to the letter. Many of the units tie up at once embattled Malta, the greatest naval victory of the war. We've been where it was hot, plenty hot. By the time we'd finished tossing our stuff, we'd put our own personal brand on part of the Jap Navy and Air Force, and we'd taken a few slugs doing it. So here we were in dry dock getting a patch job. There were workers all over the deck. What they weren't fixing, we were polishing up for our next session with the boys from Tokyo. While all this is going on, word is passed to the Hollywood Victory Committee that a damaged flat top is home for repair. So up from the film town comes a double load of names that give us a show on the spot. Danny Kaye, Dick Powell, Dale Evan, Yvonne DiCarlo, and a whole flock of others. For most of them, this was their first time on a flat top, and they were like a small town gang taking their first look at the big city. The commander shows them around, including a gander at our scoreboard that proved that we hadn't been out trolling for Barracuda. Motion picture stars arrive in Washington to aid in the nation's campaign to sell war bonds. Riding in army cars, the celebrities parade through the streets of the Capitol. Stars known to cinema fans all over the world. James Cagney. Lucille Ball. Fred Astaire. From atop the Washington Monument, we look down into an arena as thousands gather to cheer their favorites. Harpo Marx, Greer Garson, a parade of the Army's famous jeeps, and the slogan is, Back the Attack. Little Mickey Rooney and Judy Garland, all aiding the cause as the people of America invest in government bonds to win the war. Ready for launching, the new U.S. aircraft carrier Wasp. Among those invited to attend the ceremony are sons of naval officers who went down fighting with the old Wasp off Guadalcanal. And the sponsor almost misses the boat. Now it's official and the seventh warship in the history of the United States to bear the name Wasp slides down the ways to join the fleet. America's newest flat top will soon be in action against the Axis. American-made tanks bound overseas. Embarkation port for armored juggernauts arriving from factories by the train load. Here, inspectors check and prepare the tanks for the climate in which they'll be used. With adhesive tape, every opening is sealed against the moisture of an ocean crossing. Expert women drivers give the tanks a final test before running them onto long flat cars which transport them to ships waiting in the harbor. Tanks bound for fronts wherever United Nations forces are fighting. shipyards, every day new keels are being laid to swell the tide of United Nations shipping. Workers have long since voluntarily changed from peacetime jobs to war jobs. Plants operate in three shifts, hum at top speed into the night, around the clock, 24 hours a day. Red-hot rivets, burning through the blackest nights, write a message of defiance to the Axis. American workers are building the ships, and the ships are delivering the goods.
citizen soldier, G.I. Joe, had fought and defeated the best the Nazi had to offer in North Africa and had taken the enemy's measure. Now he was a veteran who had growing confidence in himself and in his leadership. He was a soldier. Whether he knew it or not, he was adding new glory to the traditions of the American fighting man. And at war's outcome, the word defeat had never been written on the scrolls of that fine tradition. In many areas, there was nothing more than a rut or a road. So units of the 7th Army did a little amphibious leapfrogging along the coast in their push for Messina. The 7th Army pushed the Nazis across Sicily. In faraway New Guinea, the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment made an airdrop at Nadzam, while American and Australian ground forces continued to press forward. Growing air power made a daylight raid on military objectives in the heart of Italy with 500 bombers. On Sicily's north coast, Patton's 7th captured Palermo and drove on eastward toward Messina. In the air, 177 American B-24 bombers raided the oil refineries at Floesti in Romania with 300 tons of explosives. no longer belong to the Nazi fascist axis in the air or on the ground. For world conquest had been stopped all the way around the earth. From North Africa to the Pacific, where U.S. Army troops and Marines captured the Munda airfield on the island of New Georgia.
On the same day our troops took Munda, Soviet forces smashed German defenses in central Russia. military targets on the Italian mainland were being mauled by our Air Force. Our ground forces were also hitting the enemy with devastating power. Crushing defeat suffered by the Axis in North Africa and Patton's advance toward the Straits of Messina were psychological poison to a badly shaken fascist regime. The once triumphant Caesar God, who had looked like this at the height of his power when his fascist legions had slaughtered and conquered Ethiopian tribesmen who fought with spears and ancient guns, now looked like this. Mussolini had led his people through a nightmare of military disasters. His arrogant dictatorship had come to an end. Retributive justice was close at hand. The King of Italy ordered Marshal Pietro Badoglio to organize a new government and conduct secret negotiations for surrender. A separate peace by Italy was the last thing Hitler wanted. The collapse of Mussolini and his fascist regime brought additional German forces pouring into Italy. From fighting ally, the Nazi was now the unwelcome intruder who would wage his battles of fierce resistance on Italian soil, bringing further ruin and suffering to an exhausted and war-sick people. On the 17th of August, 1943, 38 days after the invasion began, Patton's 7th Army took Messina and all Sicily was in Allied hands. As well as 100,000 Italian prisoners. Most of the Nazis had escaped to the mainland across the Straits of Messina. Eleven days after the fall of Sicily, Allied headquarters in the Pacific announced the end of all Japanese resistance on New Georgia Island. General MacArthur's forces were starting on the road back. We had already begun our island hopping in the central Solomons. But the battle for Nazi-held Italy was only beginning. On the 3rd of September, two British divisions crossed the Straits of Messina to land on the toe of the Italian boot.
Six days later, American forces struck the beach at Salerno, 30 miles south of Naples. They met stiff enemy resistance. days after the landings, the hurriedly reinforced enemy launched a strong counterattack, pouring in some of its best troops. For a time, our foothold was precarious. But supported by a concentration of combined firepower from aircraft, naval guns, and artillery, the Allies held the beachhead. The heavy pounding by land, sea, and air was too much for the Nazis. They fell back as our own forces pushed on toward Naples. By then, Italy had surrendered unconditionally, was officially out of the war. October 1st, 1943, elements of General Mark Clark's Fifth Army entered the city of Naples. They were greeted not as conquerors, but as liberators. The citizens of Naples knew that we and our allies were the only hope of driving the Germans from their homeland. Here, as elsewhere, a new problem confronted our invasion forces. How to provide government for the civilian population. Years of fascism had promised plenty, but delivered only strife and hunger. Unless such centers of hungry population along a route of advance are well controlled, the advance is hampered. Communications break down, supply channels clog up. In Naples, the Allies met the challenge and thwarted chaos. The Naples water supply presented another challenge to the Allied forces. This problem was also mastered. was a necessity, one which also had a direct influence on post-war rehabilitation throughout Europe. Following the fall of Naples, we expected our advance to continue. It did, but only for a brief period. The mountainous regions of central Italy provided the Germans with a number of natural defense lines. These, together with the closing in of the Italian winter, virtually stopped our forces in their tracks, scarcely 80 miles from Rome.
while our fighting men in Italy were faced with a veritable stalemate, an entirely different kind of war was going on in the faraway Pacific, where Allied forces landed on Mono and the Sterling Islands in a campaign launched to drive the Japanese from Bougainville. invaded the Gilbert Islands. The 2nd Marine Division took Tarawa after 76 hours of bloody fighting. Heavy casualties were suffered. But the Japanese were wiped out. Elements of the Army's 27th Infantry Division took Macon and the neighboring atoll. Air Corps was engaged in massive bombing of the industrial heart of Germany, devastating Nazi plants and marshalling yards. But the Nazis gutted Emmerung, the twilight of the gods, had yet to come. bitterest of large-scale battles had yet to be fought, and some of these were soon to come on the Italian front, where strong defensive positions were held by a tough and stubborn enemy. That and the weather had bogged down our advance. It was winter, 1943. The stage was set for the Cairo-Tehran talks. Roosevelt and Churchill met with Chiang Kai-shek at Cairo. Even at the moment fighting was most intense in Italy, high-level master plans continued to be made for the invasion of France and for other allied operations throughout the world. At Cairo, talks centered on the relation of European operations to the war in the Pacific. From Cairo, Roosevelt and Churchill flew to Tehran, where for the first time during the war, they met with Marshal Stalin, dictator of Soviet Russia. The Allied leaders failed to agree on everything, but one thing they did agree upon was that the invasion of Normandy in southern France must and would take place sometime during the following summer of 1944. For some time, there had been doubt as to who would command Overlord, the invasion of Normandy. 
Roosevelt, en route home from Tehran, stopped off at Tunis to see General Eisenhower and to tell him that he was to command Overlord. The grand design for victory in Europe was now completed. But so far as the Allies in Italy were concerned, France and the cross-channel invasion were a long way off. It was to be a tragically long winter of hard fighting in Italy. There was the battle for Monte Cassino. To bypass the mountainous terrain holding up our advance in southern Italy, this has made an amphibious landing at Anzio, only 35 miles south of Rome. Heavy Nazi resistance stalled the breakout from the beaches. Finally, we blasted our way out of the pocket. The landings at Anzio convinced Hitler that we were launching an all-out campaign in Italy. He rushed eight more divisions to reinforce his army in Italy, and the stalemate was resumed.